So good afternoon, everybody. And uh, uh, Jose Manuel Perales, please uh, mute yourself. <laughs> uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for for joining us in this uh, uh, breakout session about the uh, environment and and medicines in the environment. Um, um, uh, there's another interesting session, so 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 uh, we, we appreciate that you you stayed here with uh, with us, and I'm sure that the three speakers that we have this afternoon will make it very exciting and and uh, and um, uh, uh, will deliver some interesting information. Uh, I, I will start presenting myself just briefly. My name is Ricardo Carapeto, uh, and I chair uh, the the um, environmental working group. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, that operates here uh, in EMA in the European um, uh, Agency. Um, I'm also a veterinarian and I work in the Spanish Medicine um, uh, Agency where I do environmental risk assessment. Uh, this session, this breakout session uh, um, that we are having now uh, will be about the environment and, and medicines, as I said, and I think uh, um, uh, we have a good representation of the speakers that, uh, that will deliver on uh, um, uh, uh, the topic in the way we thought it would be more interesting for for you. Uh, first of all, we will have first presentation uh, um, uh, from Michael Empel um, uh, that will uh, give you some details about how do we ensure that um, uh, um, that the medicines that are authorized. Um, uh, well, how do we ensure about the risks uh, of the medicines that we authorize for for the environment? The second speaker will uh, talk about specific case study, let's say, about uh, um, medicines. Uh, uh, it will be uh, Haru Kronis talking about uh, an ongoing project uh, um, at EMA level uh, um, uh, on the effects of pet parasiticides in the environment. And the last speaker, uh, uh, Ivo um, uh, Roisinik, how do you pronounce it? Close enough. <laughs> Close enough, okay. Uh, Ivo Rosing uh, uh, will uh, will talk to you about uh, the the wider picture of uh, uh, um, substances in the environment and how do we uh, assess uh, um, uh, the level of um, uh, um, uh, harmfulness that <laughs> that they imply in the environment. So I don't want to delay it many more, and I want to introduce first uh, um, to the first speaker that is uh, um, um, Michael Empel, Doctor Michael Empel. Uh, uh, Michael is a, is a veterinarian. He, he got a degree in Hanover, uh, um, and he's also certified specialist in, in uh, pharmacology, veterinary pharmacology and toxicology, and a European registered uh, toxicologist. He has a PhD in toxicology, and uh, uh, he works here in the um, uh, European Medicines Agency. Uh, we will, uh, work very closely and we know uh, perfectly uh, each other because uh, um, basically we work in the uh, in that environmental working group that I, that I uh, mentioned before. Um, he's half a uh, German, half a uh, Greek, and he's very proud of the pistachios he, he produces in, in, in Greece. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Ricardo. Um, Yes, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, indeed, so my talk today will focus on giving you the basics um, of the environmental risk assessment for veterinary medicinal products. Um, and then uh, as a segue into the next um, speaker's presentations, I'll give you a little bit of an overview on, on current issues. But before I do so, uh, I'll, I'll first want to introduce uh, the topic to you, then give you a few basic principles uh, on how we do the era for veterinary medicines. Rest assured, I will not be too technical, so this will hopefully not be too boring for you. Then I will summarize, and then, as I said, I will go to the current issues. So um, before uh, actually explaining you exactly what we do, um, Oops, doesn't seem to work. Yeah, now it works. Uh, let me first introduce um, the topic a little bit. So as you've heard uh, today, um, the aim of, of every procedure that um, of, to authorize a veterinary medicinal product, or abbreviated VMP, as we call it here, um, is to ensure that uh, um, a drug is, uh, has a certain quality, is safe and efficacious, right? Um, and when we look at the safety, um okay um sylvia if you could maybe yeah put the mouse in there 
Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, um, if we look at the safety uh, of of such a VMP, uh, these have to be safe for the treated animal, for the user, for the consumer, which is a specialty for for VMPs because on the human side we don't have that, and of course for the environment. Um, and this is what I'm going to focus on today. So, why is this important? Um, okay. Oh, apologies. So um, the aim of, of the Environmental Risk Assessment, or ERA as we call it, um, is, as you can imagine, to protect the environment and ecosystems. Um, and this includes public health. As we've heard from, from other speakers uh, earlier this morning, um, all the ecosystem or all the environment, basically, um, and all organisms living there are intertwined. So you can imagine, for instance, on the left-hand side, you see those uh, cows near a water stream grazing. And you can also imagine that if you would treat those animals with a VMP, uh, that uh, residues of that VMP could be found uh, in the excreta of those animals and directly come into contact with the water stream or with the grass, um, so with, with the wider environment. And this, of course, does not apply only to terrestrial animals, but also to um, marine animals, uh, as you can see on your right side. But there um, you see also that um, all animals um, inside the food chain, inside the ecosystem are linked together, which means that if you treat an animal with a certain uh, VMP, chances are that you will find residues of that VMP uh, via the environment in your food. And therefore, we need to make, of course, sure that uh, the environment, the ecosystem, and of course, also the public health um, are protected. Okay, um, so for veterinary medicines, we have about seven to 800 active substances available for use in, in those products. And of course, these uh, substances are used to have a certain effect, right? To treat a disease, um, but they may also have unwanted effects on the environment. Um, and here uh, I gave you two examples. This is of course not limited to those examples, but uh, in, for example, if you take an antimicrobial, um, the intended effect of that is, of course, to be active against pathogenic bacteria, right? However, um, if this gets into the environment um, and excreted from the treated animal, um, then it might have activity against useful bacteria that are found in soil, water, and, for example, sewage treatment plants. Um, and there, uh, of course, can disrupt the function of those sewage treatment plants. Same applies to parasiticides, which are used to be active against um, pathogenic or unwanted endo and ectoparasiticides. Um, like, you know, many people that have a pet, for example, treat uh, their dog against fleas, for instance. But again, those substances um, are not selective against just one type of insect, for instance, or one type of, of parasite, because they're active, they may be active also against non-target organisms, right? So, for example, protozoans, insect worms that are found in, in nature and obviously have a useful um, function there. And... Um, Sylvia, keep them. Yeah. So the reason I'm telling you all of this um, is that we do have examples of uh, environmental incidents, and if actually uh, unwanted residues of um, of veterinary drugs reach the environment, this may have unintended effects. Um, This may have unintended effects. For instance, the Asian vulture crisis that happened in the early 90s to 2000s, and this was alluded to earlier in, in the talk, um, but this is basically the incident that is at the basis of this, right? So what happened there was that um, a population of vulture species that is endemic to the Indian subcontinent decreased suddenly up to 95%. And uh, this happened in the early 90s, and the reason was only identified in 2004, so several years later, um, and it was found that vultures had fed on carcasses of cattle treated with an anti-inflammatory drug, diclofenac. And um, this drug induces in, in those uh, birds uh, renal failure, which then leads to uh, a disease which we call visceral gout. So uric acid uh, is found everywhere in the body um, and leads to the death of those animals. Now, this would be bad enough in itself, right? But the um, publication that was... Sylvia, I think. Uh, 
Um, so, um, and, and uh, this is the publication that was alluded to uh, later, um, that, of course, the population um, of vultures uh, declines drastically, but this also has um, uh, unintended effects on society. And this is the publication that was cited earlier. Um, and um, you can see that, uh, or the result of that publication is that all death uh, or all cause death um, or mortality in humans where these vultures used to be um, living increased by 4%, as was said. The reason for this being that, for example, the vultures were what we call nature's cleaning machines, right? So they were uh, getting rid of the carcasses, okay, which then um, um, stopped contamination, for example, of water streams um, and um, the coming of uh, other uh, scavengers, such as dogs and rats, which bring other diseases like rabies, for instance. And since the vultures were not available anymore because they were nearly extinct, uh, dogs and rats um, were um, multiplying um, and bringing uh, infectious diseases. And of course, the water where those carcasses were found uh, was more polluted and then obviously um, leading to an increased rate of death um, for the population in those areas. And um, if you actually think that this only happens uh, in India, you might be wrong because um, at least uh, the decline or at least incidence of uh, vultures that have been um, dying because they fed on carcasses um, of animals treated with um, anti-inflammatory drugs also happens here in Europe, for instance, as outlined here in this article. Um, in Spain, although this was not diclofenac, this was flunixine, but the principle is more or less um, the same. So, um, and looking at all this, I mean, there, there are, of course, other examples as well. Here in the Netherlands, for instance, we had an incident in 2019 where uh, a certain population of birds um, declined uh, in other incidents. And considering all of this, um, it's not really uh, surprising that the EU, um, as a world leader actually in this, um, is engaging in a lot of um, initiatives to prevent the pollution of the environment um, uh, with pharmaceuticals. Um, first and foremost, uh, with the so-called European Union strategic approach to pharmaceuticals in, in the environment, which also tries to tackle uh, human uh, em so emissions from human medicinal products uh, into the environment uh, to uh, Green Deal actions such as the zero pollution ambition or the farm to fork strategy, with, which also tackles antimicrobial resistance and uh, the EU chemical strategy for sustainability. So there are a multitude of actions that the EU is taking, as I said, um, in, in uh, way ahead of other um, jurisdictions in order to tackle um, the, the potential detrimental effects of pharmaceuticals in the environment. Um, and um, before going into uh, detail on what we exactly do to assess the risk of veterinary medicines, uh, I'd like to quickly give you an overview of the potential environmental entry routes for medicines, um, which are outlined on the following um, slide. Um, and um, you can see on the left-hand side, for example, livestock that is treated um, can uh, via uh, their excreta, which are stored, for example, as manure and slurry, and then uh, put onto fields as um, fertilizer. All of this may lead to the um, emission of pharmaceuticals into soil and then through um, leakage into groundwater to a receiving water compartment. The same applies also to companion animals, for example, uh, when you uh, bath a treated animal or when um, the treated animal urinates um, in the environment, then all of that would be excreted into the soil. Then you have routes such as the inappropriate disposal of medicines. Of course, you have aquacultures, which um, are, to no surprise, directly emitting pharmaceuticals into the water compartment and then emissions through the manufacturing process. Um, also here on this slide, you have emissions from the treatment um, of humans. Um, there, in contrast, uh, actually, to veterinary medicines, the most common entry route here would be through um, water, would be in the water compartment through sewage plants, right? Whereas for veterinary medicines, you have a huge um, uh, emission through uh, the soil and also direct emission into um, receiving water compartments in aquaculture. Importantly, um, the whole risk assessment process that I will outline in a minute 
um, considers all these um, emissions, meaning that um, the treatment of companion animals, for instance, is considered to have or is associated with a lower risk of environmental um, emission than, for example, the treatment of a whole, whole flock of cows or livestock, which, if you treat all those animals, would lead to a much higher environmental um, contamination uh, than, for example, a single dog. And um, so let me now go to the basic principles, which um, are um, laid down in the new VMP or the VMP regulation, as we call it. So we've heard about this uh, quite a lot today. So regulation 2019-6. And in that regulation, it is stated that an ERA, is, so an environmental risk assessment, is mandatory for all applications. There are a few exceptions, but generally um, it's, it's mandatory for all applications. It's also said that this should be conducted in two phases, of which the first shall always be performed. I'll give you a bit more details on that in a minute. And uh, unlike for human medicinal products, for veterinary medicinal products, if an unacceptable risk to the environment um, is identified, then that can be a reason for non-authorizing the VMP. Um, and the basic process to follow is uh, described in internationally harmonized uh, guidance documents, for example, in documents uh, published uh, or agreed upon in, in the forum that we've also heard earlier uh, called VSCH, uh, which are the two main guidances. But we also have EMA guidance documents where um, all steps that need to be taken to assess the environment properly are outlined. There's one exception that I will come to uh, at, my, uh, at the very last uh, part of my talk, for which we are currently working actually on a guideline, but there is none um, existing at the moment. So um, how does the process look? So this looks like a very complicated uh, scheme. In fact, it's not that complicated. What it shows is that you have your two phases and that in each of the phases and each of these uh, points or tiers, as we call them, um, on that, uh, in that scheme, you have to assess whether there is a risk or not. And on how to assess that, this is uh, outlined in those guidelines. So, for example, if you go to phase one and you identify no risk, then you can stop. Nothing else needs to be done. If you identify a risk, then you need to progress to phase two and uh, first start with tier one. When you identify a risk in tier one, you continue to a tier B, etc., until at the very end, after tier C, you have to um, see, um, or the CVMP or, or the European Medicines Agency or the National Competent Authority has to actually evaluate whether the risk to the um, environment um, is unacceptable or whether the benefit of the drug um, outweighs the risk to the uh, um, to the environment. So um, the basic principle for this is always that we try to uh, determine the risk. What do I mean by this? This is basic, a basic principle of toxicology in general, um, which describes that the risk, so the probability of something bad happening, okay, uh, is equal the hazard times the exposure. Okay, so the hazard here is defined as how dangerous is something. In that case, it would be our drug, right? And the exposure is the time or the amount to which um, the environment would be exposed to that drug. And the cartoon here on that slide outlines that very well. In that case, uh, the sun is the hazard, right? And the exposure time is defined by the use of, um, um, of uh, a parasol. Um, and if you are uh, for a very long time uh, without protection under the sun, your risk increases. While if you're protected, your risk um, is still considered to be very low. Okay, so that is the basic principle uh, under which we are, which we operate. And um, in in phase one, as I told you earlier, we try to determine whether there's a risk or not in order to progress to the second phase. And the main question here to answer: so in phase one, we try to assess the exposure. So high, how high is the environment um, exposed to a veterinary medicine if we treat an animal with that medicine? And um, this phase one is outlined in a guideline. And in this guideline, you have a decision tree with uh, qualitative and quantitative questions, right? With qualitative, I mean that these are questions that you can answer with a, um, um, well, with certain qualities. For example, um, it, what target species is this? Uh, what will be the pattern of use, right? So you cannot put really numbers to this. The quantitative question, um, are uh, associated with certain uh, thresholds of certain concentrations that can be uh, or that, that should not be exceeded unless 
a phase two or a next phase is triggered. So in that case, for the quantitative question, we would try to um, assess whether the exposure is higher than certain safe trigger values that have been established. And in order to do this, we, um, we put down basic worst case assumptions. So for instance, we always assume that the full dose given to an animal is the one that will be excreted to the environment. Okay, so the highest dose that is intended for use in the animal is the one that will be in the environment. That is, of course, a very worst case assumption because usually that's not what happens. Um, but the idea here is to have a first evaluation for the environmental risk um, and, and the use uh, associated with that BMP. Sorry, Michael. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that you have 20 minutes. Uh, and oh, apologies. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll be very No, no, no. I finish it, but uh, please. Uh, yes, I yeah, I will be. I will be Thank you. Yes. Um, okay, next. Okay, so this is uh, the phase one decision tree. Due to time reasons, I will not go through this, uh, but here you can see the qualitative questions. For instance, you know, will the VMP be only used in non-food animals, right? And here you have a second part where you have to kind of answer these questions for your product, and you will see that there are, um, at the very uh, end here, aquatic and terrestrial trigger values. And if your exposure, exposure to the environment is below those trigger values, then you will need to trigger a phase two. So, um, the exceedance, as I said, of such a safe trigger value indicates a potential risk. And there, therefore, we need to do a more in-depth assessment, which then would lead us to phase two. And um, as, as you saw earlier, this is um, the, the scheme for phase two. And a phase two assessment, um, in, in a phase two assessment, uh, you try to uh, answer, once you have assessed the exposure, actually, you try to answer the question, how dangerous is the VMP actually once it is um, exp once it is in the environment and higher than the safe values, okay? And what can be done about it? And th there, for, in order to uh, assess this, you have to collect experimental or real world data to get uh, information about the, the drug's behavior and fate in the environment and to define certain levels at which uh, the VMP induces or does not induce toxicity. And from each tier uh, that, that passes, uh, and, and that you, that uh, one has to do, the testing gets more complex, right? Um, and at each level and at each tier, we try to define what we call the so-called risk quotient. This is basically uh, an easy calculation. You take the exposure level or the concentration of the exposure and divide it by the toxic level. And if the toxic level, or the, sorry, non-toxic level, and if the non-toxic level is below the exposure, no risk, right? And if um, the exposure is um, above the non-toxic level, then you obviously have a risk and need to address that. So uh, each time you have a problem, uh, meaning a risk to the environment, you have to progress to the next tier. And in summary, this would lead us to the following scheme. So you have in phase one, you, you assess the exposure, you decide whether there is a phase two error necessary or not. Then you first start with a phase two tier A, in case uh, you have identified um, a risk. You collect experimental data, you calculate the RQ. If it is above one or below one, if it is above one, you progress to phase two tier B and tier C in case the quotient is still above one. And then at the very end of the process, you um, have to assess whether you can um, mitigate the risk by applying certain measures. For instance, telling the farmers to not spread the manure on the fields or to incinerate the animal waste. Um, and then if still the risk is unacceptable, then um, the VMP cannot be authorized. So um, let me quickly come to current issues to introduce uh, the next speakers. One current issue is VMPs used in aquaculture. And this is the one topic I told you earlier that we do not have um, a guideline. Um, and the problem here is that the aquaculture sector is... Uh, um, um, will pro very probably grow because fish is a very nutritious and, and healthy food product. Uh, but the problem is that um, wild catch uh, and, and that, that um, is, is used to feed uh, humans obviously is limited, right? And the seas are quite overfished. So in order to compensate for this, we do need aquaculture. However, that growth may only be achievable through the use of veterinary products. And... Um, the farming of fish may have a considerable impact on the environment and ecosystem, depending on the type of aquaculture. And up to now, we have a bit the same problem that we discussed earlier with bees, that the number of available VMPs is very low. 
in aquaculture. Um, and that entices a lot of off-label use and actually unauthorized use um, of, of chemicals, for instance, or biocides that not, are not even authorized as a VMP, but are just used because um, there is no um, available uh, VMP. And uh, we tried to actually uh, tackle that by um, developing a guideline because as you will, um, if you look into detail into uh, the SEH guideline six, the decision tree, you have this one question, are aquatic species reared in a confined facility? And this is the only um, type of guidance we have um, for aquaculture species. So only uh, this guideline addresses um, only um, species that are reared in a confined facility. So open sea cages, for instance, are not um, addressed. And this leads to um, disharmonization because no guidance is available um, and regulatory insecurity. Um, and um, therefore, we try to tackle that by um, currently developing a specific era for aquaculture guideline. And the second topic uh, that is um, currently uh, a very hot topic and will be discussed by Haru in a minute is the parasiticides for cats and dogs topic, as I call it. And this relates to uh, question three of the decision tree, where you can see here um, um, that it says, will the VMP be used only in non-food animals? And if that question is yes, you stop. So nothing else happens. This is based on the assumption that a single animal or a single dog uh, will be treated um, and that that is not a considerable impact on the environment. However, considering several factors that Haru will, um, will discuss in more detail later, um, and also a lot of scientific publications, as I have outlined here, that came out in, 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 the, um, in recent years, um, this assumption uh, may not be entirely correct anymore. And therefore, um, we have addressed this in the form of a reflection paper that Haru will um, outline now. So with this, uh, I thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions um, at the very end of the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, as Michael just said, uh, please keep your questions for the for the end of the uh, of the session. Uh, of course, if you are not in the in the room and 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 uh, um, you're online and you want to write it in on, on the on the chat, you can do it now. And we, but we will go later to the um, to the questions. So so we will jump directly to the next uh, speaker. Uh, today that is uh, uh, Haru Kronis uh, and Haru, uh, which is sitting uh, beside me, uh, um, uh, she works in the Austrian um, uh, agency and she is uh, um, a, a, a chemist and she has a specialization in chemical engineering and environmental technology. Um, and uh, uh, well, uh, well, she has also a, a toxicology postgraduate uh, uh, and she's as Michael, a European registered uh, uh, toxicologist. Um, I also know her very well because we, uh, uh, with Michael, we both three, with the three of us, work together in the um, environmental uh, group in this uh, uh, in this agency. And she has been for the last uh, couple of years or more. Almost three years, my God. And for the last three years, almost, she has been very much involved in the development of the work that is going to present you now and uh, I uh, know that you will find it very interesting uh, it's about the parasiticides uh, um, uh, uh, used in in our dogs and cats and the environment so Haru on your own time thank you. yes thank you for inviting me today to present this topic which indeed has kept me busy for almost three years now and before I start um, Now, it, yeah. before I start, I, ha I must say that the views expressed today are not necessarily that of the EMA or my agency. These are my personal views. And with this, I show the overview today. First, I'm going to give you some background on parasites and One Health, some general information on the reflection paper we developed in the last three years. And I'll give you a short overview on the types of active substances and ectoparasiticidal veterinary medicinal products we have in Europe and the European economic area. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, environmental exposure pathways and environmental behavior of these substances, and then on how to address knowledge gaps best in the future. So we have the parasites uh, uh, and the cats and dogs. Uh, 
we're focusing on the parasites that uh, infest cats and dogs here now, which are basically uh, ectoparasites on the left hand, fleas, lice, ticks, mites. And there are, of course, also uh, endoparasiticides that are in the side of the animals, which are basically all types of worms, tapeworms, flukes, roundworms. And the important thing is that these uh, parasites may also be important vectors of pathogens, of diseases, and they may pose a serious risk not only to the animal, also to humans, and that's when we come into the zoonosis topic, into public health. Yes, and on the other side, uh, side we have the cats and dog population in the EU, and uh, we analyzed that for the reflection paper, and the numbers uh, of cats and dogs in Europe, there are not really many robust numbers, so the European pet food industry estimated about 138 million pet cats and dogs uh, in EU and the EEA. Um, and what is important to know is that the trend is increasing and this has been happening in the last year. So there are more and more pet animals in Europe. And what also has to be noted that there is also a considerable considerable number of stray and abandoned animals in Europe, and the numbers for them are even uh, less robust. So we only found an estimate for the whole of Europe, including non-EU countries. And why is that important? Uh, because these animals, due to the public health issues that I talked about before, they are treated by municipal organizations also, but we do not know the extent and frequency they are treated against parasites. So we have a multitude of parasiticidal veterinary medicinal products on the market. Uh, but what is also important to know at this point, uh, that such VMPs should only be seen as part of a treatment and prevention plan for parasitic infestations. And in the ideal case, uh, it's a veterinarian that should consider all the multiple factors that uh, how uh, a parasite infestation could be either treated or prevented. And there are factors like clinical diagnosis, lifestyle of the animal, travel plans, owner compliance, and there are many non-medical measures too, for example, uh, avoiding high parasite load areas, et cetera. And all these considerations uh, fall within this uh, one health perspective. So we have the public health on one side. And for the animal, it's not only a nuisance to have ticks and fleas. There are also some diseases and conditions like contagious, uh, cutaneous lesions, allergies uh, that have to be considered. But as you see, what's missing here at the moment, at least uh, in many countries and for many people, uh, is the environmental sustainability. So this is normally currently not really considered, at least in most countries, uh, when thinking of uh, the treatment and prevention of parasitic infestations. So why is this? As Michael has said before, the current legislation, the international legislation, considers the risks for the environment to be negligible due to the small quantities used in each animal. You have to know that this VICH guideline 6 was developed in the 1990s, when it was already a really big step that the environment was considered at all. And it's, uh, of course, at the beginning, it was livestock animals that were mostly considered. but. We also know that if this kills parasites, uh, this could also be a problem for other arthropod non-target species. And that's why, as Michael already said, this assumption may not be appropriate anymore. And uh, the reflection paper was developed. And it's also important to know that a reflection paper is not a guideline. It's more or less uh, a paper that should be bring everybody on the same page to communicate the current state of scientific discussion. And why was the uh, reflection paper initiated? As already said, there were seven, several publications in recent years that attributed the presence of mostly it was neonicotinoids and other substances like fipronil that came into uh, the public awareness due to the issues they had from other uses, from agricultural use, from biocidal use. And they were found in the environment, in the aquatic uh, environment. 
and some authors attributed the use of ectoparasiticidal products in pets uh, uh, they attributed to concentrations they measured to that, but there was no direct link to that. And the one uh, publication that really uh, hypothesized a direct link between the death of songbird chicks and the treatment of dog with parasiticidal compounds was highlighted in 2019. So there was really this adverse event, the potential adverse event following the NP use. And uh, shortly after that, the concept paper was developed by the Environmental Risk Assessment Working Party. This is something like a three-pager where uh, we, uh, the, the aims and the scope of such a reflection paper was explained, and it went to public consultation then afterwards. So uh, this was in public consultation for six months, and with all the information and opinions and further relevant feedback from the stakeholders, uh, we developed the reflection paper. Can I? Yeah. We ref uh, developed the reflection paper. This was not a three-pager anymore. This is over 60 pages now. And this also went out oh, to public consultation. And now uh, with the uh, final comments from the stakeholders, we're now in the finalizing stages of this reflection paper. So here are the aims and the scopes of uh, which are quite broad, and what we had to do is to narrow down the scope so we don't take all parasiticidal compounds, we don't take all companion animals, we just focused on cats and dogs, because they're the major companion animal species, only on ectoparasiticides now in the first place, outdoor environment, etc., and only VMPs authorized in the EU and European economic area. And today I'd like to touch on a little bit on uh, the substances and uh, VMPs there are, potential routes uh, of environmental exposure, environmental exposure pathways, and on possible monitoring options for the future. So we have, uh, we can just, uh, separate, um, classify the uh, veterinary medicinal products into two categories. Uh, those against the ectoparasiticides, it's the locally acting ones on the left-hand side or, or the topically acting ones where the uh, active substance distributed and coats the whole uh, companion animal. And then on the other hand, uh, we have the uh, systemically acting ones uh, where the substance distributes uh, through the bloodstream into the whole body and the tick or flea has to bite the animal before uh, falling off dead, so to say. Why is this important? Because the uh, mode of action uh, determines the excretion pathway or the exp environmental exposure pathway. So on the right-hand side, it will rather be excreta, feces, and urine, how the environment could get exposed. And for the locally acting ones, there are many other ways that you'll find a nice graph on the next slide. So, um, and the second way to classify those products is by the method of administration. And so there are the traditional ones, powders, shampoos, which are applied more or less like biocides. And then later the colors were developed. And again, later the spot on products where you just drop some uh, sub, uh, VMP on the back of the animal and then it coats the whole animal. And for the systemically acting ones, it's also important to know that it's not only tablets. Older products may also be injected, and there are spot on products that penetrate the skin. And then, although you apply them on the outside of the animal, they will be excreted via feces and urine. So we made a survey among the member states and identified more than 1,200 different veterinary medicinal products against ectoparasite sites for cats and dogs, uh, and these over 1,200 uh, products contained about 40 different substances. So it's not only the neonix and fipronil that have been in the uh, media a lot in the last years. There are many, many more substances that are used throughout Europe, and there are uh, huge regional differences on what is authorized and not. 
and also the next speaker will talk more, more about it. Many of these substances are also used as a biocide or pesticide, which is for agricultural use. And so we know quite a lot about their environmental behavior, which is not the case for the, uh, most of the substances on the right-hand side, the Lanaeas, Afoxolanaea and the Fluorolanaea, et cetera, because they are only authorized uh, with one exception for companion animals. And as you know now, for those, we have no environmental risk assessment. So there is hardly any knowledge on the right-hand substances, except for lufonerinone, that we have on environmental fate and behavior. And regarding the effects, I think uh, it's, it's quite clear for all of them, they're just made to kill arthropods. And uh, a little detail that I'd like also to highlight is that, especially the substances on the right-hand side, uh, they're uh, made to uh, act for a long time. So they're uh, polyfluorinated substances, which can also be called PFAS, which is a very hot topic uh, uh, regarding environmental contamination today too. And PFAS are either themselves or they may degradate to persistent chemicals that can accumulate in humans, animals, and the environment. And as you, they're also called forever substances. As you don't know um, where they end up, this is very relevant for environmental exposure considerations. So environmental exposure pathways. If you take the uh, classical to uh, locally acting ones, that's what this uh, uh, graph is about. There are really many different exposure pathways, uh, which are very different to those of uh, livestock animals in the pasture or inten intensively reared animals. And what we uh, concluded in our reflection paper that although there are really many different ways where, how the substances from the towel, from the shedding, from excreta, washing, swimming in off dogs, uh, can enter the environment. Most of them, uh, we uh, think, uh, will end up in surface waters, so in the aquatic compartment. And this may be the case for both, for systemically and locally acting substances. With the terrestrial compartment, uh, we don't know yet how and where they end up in the environment. Well, um, the, so, at the moment, uh, we cannot really say much about that. It has not been quantified yet. And we also looked at that, of course, uh, from the other uh, side, from environmental concentrations, from monitoring data. Uh, as you already saw, there have been a couple of publications out there that attributed uh, VMP use in companion animals to environmental concentrations. But to make it short, uh, we could not uh, get real hard evidence out of these data. The only thing we could conclude in the reflection paper is that we cannot rule out that the use of veterinary medicines in pet animals contribute to concentrations of these two substances. We know there are 40 out there. And we cannot rule out that they contribute to a certain risk, especially in the vicinity of wastewater treatment plant discharges. And what is also a, an important point is that we don't know how much of that these substances end up in the sewage sludge. For the terrestrial compartment, uh, the exposure path pathways are even more poorly understood. So we don't have more than some hypothesis. So there is a hypothesis that uh, dust and air from excreta or sludge of treated, in this case, livestock, not companion animals, may pose a risk to pollinators. There is also a publication that says that already the nutrients in the excreta of uh, dogs uh, or companion animals in peri-urban ecosystems disrupt uh, uh, the uh, uh, peri-urban ecosystem. So it's quite conceivable that uh, if these uh, excreta contain uh, parasiticidal substances, the stress to the environment will be even higher. But to conclude, we all these things have not been studied yet. And to come back to the initial uh, uh, example with the bird 
nests and the nesting material with the uh, contaminated dog hair. Also with this, there is a little more uh, uh, science uh, research going on on that at the moment, but we cannot quantify the importance or the impact that these uh, shedded hair have on wildlife at the moment. So what's next? A companion animal uh, products, uh, there is no, no environmental risk assessment want, uh, warranted. On the other hand, we need environmental risk assessment data uh, to elaborate uh, uh, next steps. So yes, we do recommend to address those knowledge gaps, but how could that look like? And that's why we are happy that we also have many uh, participants from academia here now. Uh, so what we do need is our specific ad hoc monitoring studies that are tailored for pet BMPs and not just mere environmental measurements of concentrations, for example, in dog swimming areas or in dog playing areas, uh, studies that are really tailored to understand the environmental exposure pathways of substances contained in such pet BMPs. And we need to uh, fill the data gaps that we have on environmental fate and behavior for those substances that are only authorized for uh, companion animal VMPs, which is the case for the novel uh, systemically acting substances. And then once we have this, uh, we will be able to understand uh, exposure pathways, uh, develop exposure models like we have them now for livestock animal. We can identify the compartments that are really at risk, and this specifically for the different products, the different mode of actions, and the different uh, routes of application. And then we can define specific environmental concerns, and this is the uh, key point to make regulatory decisions. So we have to define specific concerns, and then we can define specific product-specific environmental risk assessments and define risk mitigation measures on a regulatory basis. And this, of course, the last point, I put it in gray, is something that might be uh, done in the long run, that the international guidances that are now already over 30 years old since the they were first developed, that they are updated, and then we should all already have the answers to the questions, which companion animal VNPs would need a phase two era, so experimental studies, or how should such a phase, phase two era look like? So my take home messages are, um, the authorization of VNPs is always based on a positive overall benefit risk balance, Although, yes, uh, the environment currently is not addressed because there are many stakeholders that ask to ban all those VMPs. This, of course, cannot be done because they have a, a good benefit. And uh, please also do not make the mistake because uh, fipronil or imidacloprid is now banned in certain uses for, as for agricultural uses or biocidal uses that now all of these substances found in the environment may be attributed to the use in companion animals. There are so many extended transi transition periods, emergency uses for these substances that it's really not possible to uh, uh, divide the sources of that substances. It's the last one. It's the last one. And don't only think of fipronil and imidacloprid. And uh, what we do need to make substantiated environment risk assessments are specific ad hoc monitoring studies, as already said, and we uh, really need environmental fate and behavior information for the lanes and those substances that are potentially persistent in the environment. And with this, I'd like to close my talk. Thank you. No, thank you. It was a very, oh yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting uh, um, presentation, and I'm pretty sure that everybody um, uh, online uh, have enjoyed it. I have seen that there are several questions uh, written. As I said, um, uh, we will go through those questions at the end of the uh, of the session. Uh, so thank you very much, Haru. And uh, now I wanted to give the floor to to the next speaker, that is uh, Dr. Thibault uh, Roesink, however it is pronounced, and I'm going to. <laughs> Uh, uh, introducing uh, introducing me is uh, um, uh, 
um, an environment is studied environmental sciences in Wageningen University. Uh, well, I have troubles uh, with my with my my Dutch, um, and he's still working there in the in the Wageningen environmental uh, uh, research, where he's a senior scientist. Uh, uh, and project leader um, uh, in the group that takes care of the environmental risk assessment uh, um, uh, in that institution. And um, uh, he, in, during his PhD, he, he uh, investigated the impact of contaminants on shallow freshwater ecosystems. And he will give us uh, um, an overview of the uh, way we make the environmental risk assessment and uh, from the impacts of different uh, uh, substances apart from uh, Medicines. I don't know him personally, but today I've known that uh, uh, that he's a beekeeper. That makes him an interesting guy, I'm sure. And uh, looking forward to hear your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm well aware that I'm between you and the end of this day, so uh, I will uh, I will try to keep it a bit light and uh, uh, not to bore you with too many figures. Um, I am in control of my own presentation. That's very dangerous. So we'll uh, we'll see what will happen. And well, luckily something happens. Great. I'm going to talk about environmental impacts. And this will be partly a rehearsal of some of the things you've seen already today. Undoubtedly, it resonates with what you already know. And I really hope that I present also some new insights uh, for you today. We are not limiting ourselves to veterinary medicines only. I'm going to talk about active substances such as pesticides, biocides, pharmaceuticals, indeed veterinary medicines, um, and um, I was uh, informed that um, I should be very careful with my terminology because what for me sounds like a biological active substance might for you be a vaccine. So sometimes we might be not completely on the same page. My apologies for that. I try to do my best. Well, why do we need to talk about environmental impact? To be quite honest, active substances have a targeted use. We use them for a specific purpose, and they also need to work at a specific place, a location. That can be an arable field, that can be a livestock animal, a stable, uh, maybe if we talk about pharmaceuticals, a human being or a companion animal. However, these substances can easily end up in the environment, and there they can potentially impact non-target organisms. So they can still have that activity, but at locations and places and biological systems where they were not intended to work for. Well, if we go back a bit in time, uh, this is something we are not familiar with because we were not even born mostly at this time. This was mosquito control in the 40s where we use DDT and you might want to expect some excess exposure of the environment in this kind of situations. And that is what we learned the hard way. DDT was very persistent. We found it throughout the whole ecosystem and into the trophic change, causing all kinds of cascading effects we didn't anticipate. But more recent examples might contain medicines. I'm sure some of these figures might look familiar to you. Uh, these are, um, well, for, for the chain approach of medicines where all the actors are being brought on board to discuss this topic because medicines can enter the environment due to human use coming via water treatment plants and end up in aquatic ecosystems. Why is that a problem? Well, one of the publications by Karen Kidd uh, showed that when you look at estrogen activity, this can totally turn upside down complete ecosystems. Why? Because, well, in this little uh, figure, you see this pearl dace fish, and that was impacted greatly by the estrogen. Reproduction went down, and as it was a key component, the whole ecosystem reacted. So predators didn't have food, the algae were not eaten anymore, et cetera, et cetera, and that caused a complete lake collapse. This was in Canada, and in Canada, they actually do tests with whole lakes. So experimental lake number 204 really got it. But um, this can also happen in the actual environment. And there we can look, for instance, at pesticides. This is uh, something we use to grow our crops, to get our food, but with the use, we also 
expose the environment. For instance, via uh, what is called spray drift, the compound is sprayed, some of this cloud is drifting off the field, uh, or it can just uh, enter via runoff in waterways adjacent to the field. And then you have a certain concentration. And that certain concentration might or might not evoke effects. For pesticides, there's quite some rigorous legislation in place. And we have all kinds of scenarios where we calculate that exposure from different users throughout the EU. And those scenarios comprise climatological um, input, uh, hydrological input, and of course, the use input. And for all the EU countries, you can more or less calculate what kind of exposure you get via this routes. However, these are the logical routes, the ones you would expect from the use or the ones that already have been proven. There are also some less logical uses. This is one of the uh, examples I'd like to show you, and this is about sheep dipping. It comes from the UK. Sheep dipping is not a sport, as you might think. It is a way to treat sheep um, and bathe them in anti-lice and anti-tick. Um, uh, treated water. Uh, the sheep is pushed under, so it's completely soaked, and then it's released into the pastures. You might expect the next thing to happen, and you can already see it a bit on the picture, that UK weather is mainly dominated by... This is the, the interactive component. Yes, thank you very much. By rain, indeed. So basically, the treated sheep gets soaked by rain, and the excess uh, material is being washed out. That is an overspill coming into the water and that killed a lot of native crayfish populations in the UK. You might think like, uh, well, um, that is indeed too bad, but then somebody very clever thought like, ooh, but not only native crayfish might be susceptible, we also have a lot of problems with invasive crayfish coming from uh, the US and spreading all over Europe. So maybe we can use these insecticides to control those populations and just put it actively in the environment. Well, that is not part of this presentation, but I can go on for a whole afternoon about the effects you get from such brilliant ideas. Please don't do it. But also uh, a bit less obvious, um, I also uh, echo here the previous presentation with this nice graph of potential exposure routes of uh, veterinary medicines in companion animals. There is a load of different um, ways where these um, compounds administered to a dog, to a cat, can end up in the environment. And some of them are less obvious than others. And you might, uh, well, to me personally, it was quite a surprise that birds collecting hairs as nesting material end up exposing their chicks to certain uh, of these compounds. Also, dogs swimming in water might indeed leak, so to say, some of these compounds into the water. And indeed, you see a nice um, sequestration that if you have a flea collar, it leaks more than when you have a systematic compound being administered via a tablet. However, for some of these compounds, we have very good ideas of what it's doing because it has a comparable use in agriculture. And there, of course, imidacloprid and fipronil are the easy examples because we know a lot about them because of all the regulatory dossiers that were required in agricultural use. On the other hand, the fluorolanus and the floxolaner, the new compounds, have no counterpart use in agriculture, and therefore the information available is much, much less dense. So although we know that less of these compounds enter the environment, we have no clear idea of what they are actually doing there. Also, another surprising route is, for instance, feed. We have quite an intense uh, livestock um, husbandry in, uh, in the Netherlands, and we don't grow all the feed that is required ourselves. So we import it. We either import it from the EU, and there we have quite strict regulations, but we also import feed from outside the EU. And um, everything that is put on the food is coming into the animal. So when you take the manure and also disinfect the stables, 
and also have the bedding of the stable floor, it might end up in the solid manure fraction. That is being reused on the field and ends up in the soil. And there suddenly it has all kinds of impacts on soil invertebrates that actually should help us create a good and healthy soil environment, but are actually impacted by all kinds of indirect routes via the feed. And as you, you know that, uh, well, a lot of the feed comes from uh, South America or other parts of the world where they have completely different pesticide regulations, for instance. It's not surprising that you find compounds in manure in the fields that are not allowed either in Europe or that were never supposed to be uh, in such a use. However, the impact of these residues is only checked for livestock health. So as long as a cow doesn't drop down, we are quite okay with it. And that is, of course, a bit of a provocative way to state this, but hey, I'm the last presenter, so we go for the drinks afterwards anyway. So due to all the alternative routes from which biological active substances enter the environment, their use needs attention. As soil and especially water and sediment acts as sink, we accumulate these exposures, not necessarily from one source, but from all kinds of sources we might not even suspect are there. So regulation should look beyond authorization, PUs. Why do we have one assessment when some multiple products have the same active ingredient? And you hear that it really uh, does something to the audience online. That's good. Yes. Uh, uh, Sylvia, can we mute that? Okay, thank you. Ah, now they took away my control, so... Um, ah, there we are, there we are. Oh, too fast, too fast. So, moving away from exposure and having a look at effects, because why are we doing this? Of course, there was quite some information on antimicrobial resistance already earlier today, but there are much more effects you can expect from um, all kinds of substances. So, um, nice, I always use imidacloprid because it's a really nice example. But after the ban of agricultural use, we still exceed water quality standards, also in the Netherlands. Yes, there are indeed all kinds of emergency uh, authorizations and things like that, but I'm afraid I have to disagree a bit with my previous uh, uh, speaker. Uh, if we find exceedances right be behind uh, the sewage treatment effluent uh, or in the sewage treatments itself, it's not agricultural use. We talk about different types of use. And then, for instance, uh, pet companions come on the radar. So, very important, all these bans seem okay, but we don't solve the environmental problem because we still have a loading exceeding the quality standards. Why? Is that still important? Well, it is uh, detrimental to, for instance, mayfly populations and mayflies, although they live very short as an adult, spend quite some time of their life cycle underwater and are an important part of the food chain there. But pesticides change as well, uh, change as well. And, and also pesticide, uh, sorry, biocides do. And modern day, pesticides and biocides react much more subtle. We started with the DDT example, and that was clear. You sprayed, you looked around, you saw the insect drop dead. So you had this knockdown effect immediately. Nowadays, it is much more sophisticated. The knockdown effects are no more. Either because activities are not meant to kill, eh, they're meant to do something else, which in the end has the same uh, uh, effect, or it's a total different substance because uh, a pharmaceutical or a veterinary medicine is not meant to kill. It would be uh, uh, not a good business case. So it is meant to do something in an organism, but in an other organism, it does something completely different. Why is that possible? Because nature is lazy. If it once has a certain mechanism invented, evolved if you want, then it will use that in other types of organisms. And here you see this nice colorful graph showing the preservation of different target sites in a whole range of different 
organisms ranging from humans to the E. coli bacteria we talked about earlier. And there you see quite some conserved drug targets. And that will give some really interesting examples, which I'll show you later. Also, another possibility is that alternative exposure routes results in other environmental concentrations that are actually too low for direct mortality, but can still alter other things. And one of those things is uh, nicely presented by this um, example of fluoxetine, which is an antidepressant. And don't look at all the details, but just see the bigger picture here. This is work from uh, Lara Schuit, one of our PhDs, who um, made an inventory of all the endpoints available from fluoxetine studies. And if you look at mortality, which is uh, represented by the letter I, it is a very small section of this bigger overview. And the vast majority of endpoints is behavioral. So apparently, we are looking at other things. But how do you study behavior? Well, you can do that in the lab, of course. And this is a setup that we use, basically using a camera setup, different arenas. You put this uh, amphipod, uh, a crustacean, aquatic one, in that Petri dish, and you look at the behavioral patterns in the day and nighttime. And why is this an interesting animal? Because it's very important for organic matter processing. And of course, it's also staple food for uh, the aquatic environment. And here you see that, yes, the machine does bleep. We see something after exposure of uh, fluoxetine, but it is not mortality. It is just a small significant difference in swimming speed and general daily patterns. So why? Why should we bother? Why is that important if it's only swimming a bit slower? or it's a little less active. Well, if you look at some other studies, and uh, nice work of Thomas Brodin and uh, Fong and Ford in the UK, uh, they looked at, for instance, fish. And when they are exposed to oxazepam, another antidepressant, the small fish that used to school as an anti-predator behavior came really relaxed. They were so mellow, it didn't matter anymore. So they weren't schooling, they were just going, hey dude, how are you swimming up to the big fish? And then the big fish ate them. Okay, then you get an impact. Another uh, pharmaceutical, Fenla vaccine. Um, this is a really nice example of preserved drug target sites. We use Fenla vaccine as an antidepressant. It makes us happy because it is a serotonin inhibitor, uh, uptake inhibitor. Snails also have the serotonin system, but not because they want to be happy. They use it for locomotion. So if you put them into a Venla vaccine sparked environment, they lose the ability to move. And in this case, it were aquatic snails and they fell off the aquarium wall. Well, they don't die, but if you're a snail and you lay there in the aquatic environment, you cannot hide, you cannot defend yourself anymore. So you get eaten. Another example, octopus, very smart animals. You can train an octopus, quite easily by giving them a bit of food in a jar. And if you have colored lids and you glue the black lids on the jar and you let the white lids loose on the jar, the octopus very cleverly within minutes figures out that he should stay away from the black lids because they're glued. They can't open them anyway. So after a few trials, they will just leave them. Although they can see the food inside. If you expose them to pharmaceuticals in the water, they forget. Their cognition is impacted. They cannot remember which one were uh, glued together. So they keep trying to open the black lids, which is a completely waste of time and effort. It's not dying, but it is an impact. And why is this impact important? Well, you can only see that when you study the organism in a multitrophic situation. So you need more parts of the ecosystem, of the food chain, to see this effect because behavior in itself is difficult to place into an environmental context. But if your behavior is causing you to be eaten,
then suddenly you see things moving into uh, population builds up and especially energy transfer in different trophic levels. So why do we need to do that? Well, healthy ecosystems and the populations they're in are resilient and robust. They can handle a lot of stress. And this is more or less depicted by this diagram of Martin Scheffer, uh, who gives an idea of tipping points. If you're in a situation where you have optimal conditions, your ecosystem is very robust, you can shake the ball a bit, but it will not move into a different status. If your conditions change, suddenly the situation and the context change, and the ball can move into a different container, so to say. If you then start rocking the ball, maybe if the, eh, um, uh, the threshold is still high, it's not moving that quickly. But the more you change your system, the more the threshold is lowered. And suddenly the ball drops into a different uh, state. If you reach that tipping point, it's also very difficult to go back again. We've uh, seen that studied extensively in uh, the clear lakes uh, where nutrient additions suddenly overnight, so to say, change the lake from a macrophyte dominated state into a very turbid algae dominated state. That was very surprising. And how could that happen? Well, basically because uh, slowly under the water, literally, the system was changing so much that a little push could move the ball into the other alternative state. And it's very difficult to get back to that clear water state again. So what does that mean? Environmental impact, some final remarks. Health is not found in a pill or a shot. I think it's more like managing uh, your life or your systems. If you do that properly, you don't need the very uh, impactful use of chemistry. In line with the One Health concept, if our environment is under stress, technically that means that so are we. Maybe it's still a, way, a bit away. Maybe it's one generation away or two or whatever. But if you mess up your environment, you get into trouble. Also, try to think in scenarios. Which exposure can be expected from which use and where does it accumulate? It's not so straightforward. As I showed you in some of these examples, there are some really strange backdoors that you really have to figure out. And impact can indeed be measured or quantified, but not with traditional methods. You have to think a bit outside the box. You have to make other tests to see what it actually does. And I would say, don't wait for action for regulators. Usually that means that you're too late. So start thinking amongst yourself, involve all the stakeholders and come up with a bottom-up approach because there is a lot of knowledge. There is a lot of well, also uh, knowledge on what is practical, uh, feasible, and um, well, bottom-up approaches, in my opinion, are usually better. Thank you very much. And please contact me if you have questions later on. Okay, thank you very much, Ivo, for the very interesting presentation. Um, uh, we have some questions in the chat, but I, I, I prefer to, to check first uh, within the, the room if there's anybody who wants to ask something. Oh, yeah, uh, go ahead. Button. Okay, hello. <laughs> okay, so I was just wondering when you were testing the different medications uh, that was in the water, like with the Venla vaccine and the... How did you know how high the concentration had to be, for example, to um, be comparable to the concentration in the water, like it's in the in in the in the real environment? Thanks for your question. I have to be honest. I was also referring from other work from international papers, but it's a good question. Uh, that is always tricky because um, you can approach that two ways. You can either go to monitoring data and then see what is out there. And you can, of course, with different concentration step, do a test and see when uh, a system goes blink. 
Um, usually, um, biological systems in itself react at very high concentrations, which are not environmentally realistic. But it's when you go to that behavioral part where suddenly you have the subtle impacts of, uh, well, environmentally occurring concentrations. So that's, I think, one of the tricky parts. With pesticides that are meant to kill, you see effects quite quickly. Here we are in a much subtle uh, environment where, well, okay, yeah, it's that, that animal swims less fast at environmentally realistic concentration. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a fair question, and uh, that requires a different way of testing to to get the relevance of, of that thing uh, on the radar. Is there anybody else with a question, or can I ask the question? Okay, so the other question was, um, so is there consensus whether you can um, see what source the... Um, how do you say the pesticides are from? Because you mentioned it, they're not, and he mentioned there are. But I think it's quite interesting because I don't want to, you know, raise a discussion or anything. But um, well, maybe I do. I don't know. Anyway, um, um, I was just wondering because um, measuring a certain level in the water and then saying that is attri uh, attributable to pets. Um, I was wondering how you come to that conclusion, apart from the sewage plants you were mentioning. But um, um, is there anything else that can help to decide where it's from? Well, I, I'm glad that I touched the right level of provocativeness so, uh, to, to get these questions. And no, you're absolutely right. There is not a molecular label saying, oh, that comes from that use or it's just that molecule. But it also comes down to peeling down the yeah. onion. So um, we know, of course, well, let's stick with imidacloprid. Uh, in agricultural areas, there's a an, uh, an high concentration in the water. There it's, uh, well, not uh, easy to distinguish where it comes from, although you have a certain, well, general knowledge that if it's used in the field next door, uh, there is a likelihood. Um, if something comes from a sewage treatment plant, you're automatically out the agricultural use because there is no exposure uh, from that activity on that system. Well, they are the, the waste of the farmers themselves, but that is not what we're talking about here. So we also have information that from uh, dog parlors, where you bring your dog to get groomed and shampooed and things like that, there are huge concentrations found in their, in their effluent. So that's how you piece things together. It is still circumstantial, I agree. But, um, well, how much evidence do you need uh, to, to finally make that decision? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Very interesting indeed. If, if I may just add, in, indeed, it's a bit of a problematic one because there are many use um, for, for a lot of these substances. However, there are a few that only are used in veterinary medicine. For example, the lanars that were just um, mentioned as an example. So if you measure concentrations of those in the environment, that can only be from a VMP. So if you really have that, you know, the single out substance, and of course you could, depending on the chemistry of the substance, extrapolate a little bit from those concentrations you find to other substances as well. But the key here is like if you really want assurance from where a substance comes, then you really need to, to um analyze the substances that are only used in a certain framework and then you will get assurance otherwise it's always as as evil said a bit of a guesswork um yes i'd also like to add of course it, it from the um urban areas it's quite conceivable that it the first idea that come from pet parasiticides, no, uh, I'm fully with you in that. But then on the other hand, when digging deeper into the topic, you get information about environment, uh, sewage treatment plant concentrations coming from washing vegetables and things like that. So you won't have this robust conclusion. And this is the point I wanted to make. So yes, it's very likely, and I'm fully with you with that, but uh, you will never get robust data unless you radioactively label them. And as a true researcher, I would always say that we need more research. Yeah. And more funds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for the question. Is there any other question? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. 
Uh, yes, thank you for the very interesting talks. I have one question. I'm not very familiar with the field, I have to admit, but I was very surprised that there's no uh, risk assessment for the environment for products for companion animals, because I remember some um, procedures where we were rapporteur also in Germany, um, spot on as Felpreva or NextGuard Combo, where actually um, warning phrases regarding the environment are included. And there was also a referral from oxidectin containing products. And I would just like to ask, uh, under which regulation is this if, if there is no... Nothing up to date. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, well, um, that so we do have um, a reflection paper. So just just to maybe bring the audience uh, up to date. Usually, warnings that are con that are considered uh, for inclusion in the product information um, that is so the product leaflet and. Um, uh, the SPC that is used by the vets to know how to use the product, um, usually uh, that information needs to be based on hard data. So whatever data is in the dossier will lead to a certain conclusion if there's an environmental risk or not. That being said, there are a few exceptions uh, where products just by their pattern of use, for instance, and this is all also uh, all outlined in a special reflection paper that uh, on risk mitigation measures that is currently being updated by the Environmental Risk Assessment Working Party. There we do have some um, let's say bulk warnings that are not necessarily based on data, but just um, um, on the precautionary principle, if you like, you know, to include them. So, for example, uh, a product for dogs um, that would include a warning saying, please don't wash your dog after 48 hours after treatment or something like that. This is usually not based on the on, on data submitted in the dossier, but it's based on precaution. Right. Um, and um these kind of warnings can be, of course, um, included uh, in, in an SPC or in a PI generally. Um, but um, to answer your first question in terms of, you know, being surprised that there is no risk assessment for, for, for pets, this is all done, of course, under the, the, you know, the old directive and now the new regulation. So this is indeed the legal framework. Maybe I should add that, uh, which I didn't put in my presentation because uh, it would maybe be a bit too technical, but um, VACH guideline six contains a certain provision, which we call the however clause. And this, however, clause actually states that um, if a VMP contains a substance that has certain properties, um, then even if you would not progress to phase two, um, you would have to perform a tailored risk assessment, right? Just because there are certain doubts by the regulators. Okay, so there, this is there is a possibility to do that. Um, and in terms of moxidectin, I guess uh, I can refer to Ricardo. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for moxidectin. Just to say that the referral that you mentioned uh, only covers the, the moxidectin used in fruit producing animals, also the moxidectin used in in dogs uh, for the treatment of the uh, heartworm uh, uh, are out of the referral. Just to say that. Uh, are there any more questions, or we can jump to the chat box because the attendees are dropping uh, and <laughs> I want to give an answer to everybody before they, they leave. So so thank you for your questions and I will give, go through the first question. Um, uh, thank you for this session. Uh, uh, does a veterinary generic product uh, marketing authorization holder needs uh, to prepare an era for its products? Uh, if yes, is it to be prepared both by pharmacovigilance and toxicologist uh, personnel? Uh, I don't know, if, uh, maybe I can give an answer to that or you want to, to uh, but yeah, just to, to uh, speed up. Um, uh, if you want to apply for a generic uh, medicine um, and there is another uh, uh, products in the market authorized after 2005, you don't need to provide an environmental risk assessment because uh, it is assumed uh, that those products authorized after 2005 uh, already provided an environmental risk assessment, implying that uh, uh, the, the uh, environmental uh, risk has already been studied for that active substance and, and concentration. So that's uh, the uh, short answer. And uh, if there's none of these products in the market already and you have to prepare an environmental risk assessment, you uh, uh, make the question if it has to be prepared by a pharmacovigilance 
and toxicology personals. Uh, um, I think that the uh, toxicology um, 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 uh, toxicology personnel uh, would be okay to prepare this, but usually environmental risk assessment is a pretty difficult part of the dossier. And my experience as environmental risk assessment, uh, it has always been uh, always been outsourced. Uh, it's not our recommendation, but it's the way it is. Uh, it's a pretty uh, specific part of the dossier, and probably you will need some uh, somebody with um, a specific um, uh, knowledge on ecotoxicology, on fate and behavior in the environment, or on exposure calculations. So, so that would be um, the, the answer. Uh, next question, uh, when will the reflection paper on parasiticides uh, will be published? Uh, and there is a second part that I think has already been uh, answered. Uh, will a monograph system for VMPs active substances be established? Uh, so I think that uh, for Haru, when will the reflection paper be published? Well, the draft has already been published last year in December and uh, public consultation has closed and uh, we're now in the finalizing stages, so I don't know when the final uh, <laughs> final uh, reflection paper will be out there, but uh, I, I think I can say there will not be major changes to the draft. Okay, thank you very much. Yep, go ahead. If I may just add, uh, also not major changes, uh, and we don't expect it to take that much longer. So I suppose, but again, this is preliminary, probably December or maybe early next year. That's good to hear, thank you. Uh, next question also for, for Haru. Uh, are these substances, meaning uh, um, uh, lufenuron and, and those substances that was uh, were raised by, by Haru, um, uh, are these substances part of the considered PFAS ban in the European Union? Thank you. Well, I have to say um, that the uh, restriction proposal that was submitted by uh, five member states is currently being evaluated by the European Chemical Agency, the ECHA. So there is no uh, considered ban yet, it's just a proposal. But in this proposal that was submitted by the member states, medicinal products, including veterinary medicines, were not included. But there has been a uh, uh, recommendation, um, they recommended. Uh, how do you call it? Um, that uh, a reporting recommendation. So they included that in the proposal, but currently it's being um, uh, uh, checked by the European Chemical Agency. And what also has been, uh, what I have to say is that there are hundreds of uh, PFAS, medicinal active substances, also for human um, uh, use out there. And yes. So the PFAS and medicines are a bigger issue, and it's not only on the veterinary or ectoparasiticidal products. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, next question is a long one. Detections in the, and I think it's for Haru also, detections in the compartment doesn't mean that there are there is a risk, uh, given that these uh, uh, active substances have been used for a long time. Are there specific concerns from EMA uh, that some species may be in danger of eradication uh, through continued use, uh, monitoring data, uh, lack sources of information? Um, uh, so it's meaningless for risk uh, assessment unless compared with biota monitoring. Just because an API is detected doesn't necessarily produce a risk to a taxonomic group. I think uh, both Evo uh, uh, and, and Haru may uh, uh, give a view on this uh, question. Um, yes, as, as already, uh, I'm not sure if I got the question right, but uh, protection goal in principle, it's all uh, uh, animals and on all taxonomic uh, uh, groups, and it's on a population level. That's my, uh, for most of the time for environmental risk assessments, and yes. Uh, what we did conclude, I already tried to explain it in my presentation, is that we cannot draw conclusions yet on which compartments are more at risk or not. There are many hypotheses, maybe Ivo can tell a lot of it, but uh, we cannot give strong answers to your questions at the moment. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And um, 
uh, it is indeed tricky because uh, is something detected? Uh, does it have an impact? Yes uh, or no? The problem is uh, that we are now looking at compounds. We are not looking at the receiving end, so the ecosystem. And therefore, you miss exposure, you miss uh, impact. And what is very likely that in the near future, we will turn this around and uh, start looking at what is a system receiving and how can we regulate that. It is a hell of a job because suddenly you end up with multiple compounds doing the same thing. You do uh, multiple applications ending up in the same uh, sink, so to say. And uh, who is legally responsible for what part? That is completely unknown at the moment. But that approach is already being, well, uh, thought about and it's being ventilated uh, at different places. And we starting to have the tools, at least from the science part, to give answers. Of course, the the legal part is the difficult part at the moment, but um, yeah, this is a discussion that has not ended by far. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, also from my point of view on this question, it's usually uh, a question that we received. Uh, um, is there any trouble with this or that substance? I'm not thinking only about parasiticides, but any substance where you raised an environmental issue. Uh, um, and, and people ask for for data on actual effects in the environment. And I always say that it's uh, very difficult to see effects and, uh, and to see data on 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 the specific effects on the, on the environment because we tend to think about the catastrophes like the one mentioned uh, uh, by Michael uh, with the vultures or the one by the crayfish uh, mentioned by Ivo. Uh, but... Uh, a catastrophes happen when uh, well uh, you have surpasses surpassed all all the thresholds. In the meantime, there are a lot of effects that are not so obvious to the environment, and people don't keep on looking uh, to the effects on on small crustaceans, uh, etc. Besides, it's very difficult to find a, a, a pristine environment where uh, to compare with to say, well, this was the situation uh, before we started using imidacloprid, for example, in pets, and this is the situation now, 20 years later. That is data that we will never have, basically. So, so we have to be pragmatic and 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 and, and decide uh, uh, if it's necessary to take any action based on the data that we can have. Uh, yes, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think also that it's it's worth noting that in the EU we 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 do apply the precautionary principle. So in as as Har was said, the uh, the protection goal is um, all non-target organisms basically fall under the protection goal. And by applying this, you would assume that any concent well, or that at least some concentration in the environment could be, even if you don't know it exactly, it could be harmful. So therefore you should avoid it basically as much as possible. Um, of course, in terms of VMPs, balancing this with, with the benefit uh, of the drug. But um, this is also something to keep in mind that um, um, even if you don't have the data in, in Europe, at least we do apply the precaution um, to not emit um, too much in the environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I see that there was another comment uh, about uh, a monograph system, an article 156, and, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, it's true that article 156 is the one to, to follow. So if there are no more questions, I think that we have been here for more than one hour and a half, and I think we all had enough of this. Uh, uh, is there any other question, or, or we can go and, and have a beer? Um, Thank you very much to, to uh, the, our three presenters and for uh, to everybody uh, online um, uh, for this interesting uh, uh, discussion. And um, oh, uh, sorry, there is a, a last minute question. The proposal for the revised directive for medicines uh, under C Article Twenty Four system of uh, system of uh, ah okay, so so I guess that uh, this. Colleague, um, Dutch colleague is uh, uh, um, uh, referring to the upcoming uh, revision of the human legislation and the links uh, with the monographs uh, 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 in veterinary. So thank you for the for the information, uh, Frank. So uh, as I was saying, uh, have a nice evening and uh, thank you very much for for joining us and and for you uh, for for making the presentation. So thank you. <laughs>